What's up guys? Welcome back to our VBS. Today we are covering Genesis 7 in respect to Noah and the Flood. One thing that I always like to look at whenever I get into a new lesson is looking at the context. So as we're looking at Genesis 7, I want to go back to Genesis 6, kind of review what we've already talked about and really get the context as we move into chapter 7. So beginning in Genesis 6 verse 5, we really want to emphasize the wickedness of man. Uh, the verse reads, The wickedness of man was great. Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only on evil continually. Now, this scene may seem like a, a verse that's kind of generalized, but at this point, we really want to emphasize the fact that every single thing that people were doing was evil. There was no good in the world. Everything was evil. The King James Version says that it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. ESV version reads, The Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. And the New American Standard says, The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. Personally, I like the way the King James Version uh, phrases this. When it says it repented, usually when we think of repentance, we think of someone coming down during the invitation song and sitting on the front pew. Sometimes they're crying. Sometimes they're just very remorseful. But it gives us something that we can cling to, something that we can understand how serious the Lord was in pain right here. So, I think it's very easy to say the overall status of man from the fall to the current state of the world before the flood is not a very good one. As we can read later on throughout chapter 6, the Lord sees no other option than just to hit the reset button on the entire earth. Makes me think back when I was a little kid and I was playing a video game or something, I always hit that level I couldn't beat. I'd always just start over because then I'd get mad at myself. Um, but for the moment, all hope in mankind is lost. Until we see Noah. Noah was the only person in the entire world seen as favorable or worthy of grace in the eyes of God. Genesis 6 verses 9 through 10 seems a little bit out of place at first. The verses show us that when Noah was seen by God, he was seen as a man worth saving and helps us understand that Noah was seen as the most righteous. Keep in mind when it's most righteous, this is not saying Noah earned himself to this status. This is by a comparable state to the rest of the world. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This is showing that Noah was chosen by the grace of God. The rest of chapter 6 primarily is, pre is preparation for the flood. This includes giving the building dimensions, uh, the number of animals, and number of animals that are clean versus unclean, and directions for dealing with the animals once they get on the ark and throughout the course of their journey. Uh, chapter 7 starts with God telling Noah to enter the ark with all of his family and the animals of the earth. As we know, this includes eight humans, and two of every kind of animal that is unclean, and up to seven of every kind of animal that is clean. This is the part, during this part, there is a notice ahead of time of the flood. We see it. there's a week's time, there's seven days. Um, and during that time of the week, there is a lot of preparation that is really coming to a close here. Everything that God has went over is being brought to fruition. Noah was approximately 530 years old when he was tasked with building the ark. Noah didn't have his first son on record until he was 500 years old. And the flood came 100 years at later, as we can see in Genesis 7 verse 6. This allows for approximately 25 to 30 years for his children to grow up, mature, and get married. Then we see Noah is left with approximately 70 years to build the ark. Now this is an uncompromisable feat. This is, an, this is incredible. And there's only one way that this can be done, and that's through God. We see, just to give you a few dimensions on the ark, the ark was 510 feet long. That's two and a half times bigger than the Challenger Space Shuttle. It is longer than 62 smart cars lined bumper to bumper that would touch the ark's bow and stern. It's longer than 12 40-foot telephone poles stacked end to end, and it's longer than a football field and two-thirds of another one's put end to end. Moving on to the width of the ship, it was 85 feet wide, which is half as tall as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. 
and it was 51 feet high, which is five basketball goals stacked on top of another, plus another foot, but who's counting? Long story short, this ship was massive. Possibly one of the biggest things that the Earth had ever seen. This ship, had, there was nothing ever seen like it in its time, and without modern power tools, would have been impossible to build without the help of God. You see, Noah had no tools, had no cranes, had no way to manufacture a boat in any modern way that we see here. It took my brother-in-law, his name is Daniel, it took him two years to build a five foot by four foot dining room table for my sister without the use of power tools. It took him two full years. He had to build everything, had to cut the wood by himself, had to sand it down, had to stain it, had to paint it, had to finish it. Two years for a dining room table. Think about that. So put that into perspective of Noah building an ark that is almost two football fields long. That's almost half the height of the Leaning Tower of Pisa and is wider, I'm sorry, I'm getting tripped up, wider than half the height of the Tower of Pisa and taller than five basketball goals stacked on top of each other. That's insane. It's crazy to think about it. Noah had help with the help of his sons, but even then, four men in a task this large only can be done through God. <clears throat> Imagine staying in a tornado bunker for a week's time. It's, it's, it's a weird thing to think about. But then imagine there's no TV. So there's no warning. There are no sirens, no TV broadcasts, no meteorologists warning you and telling you to go to your safe place, no signs of bad weather, only a message from God that a tornado will come to your hometown. Would you listen to it? Naturally, one might say no. But this is the case of Noah as we move on through chapter 7. This is exactly what Noah had. Noah had no warnings except from God. He had a voice that told him this would happen. And this really shows Noah's faithfulness and his obedience. Think about everyone that would ridicule you for staying in a tornado bunker or a safe spot for a week's time just knowing that a flood would happen. People would come to your house, they would mock you, they'd ask you to come outside with them, go hang out. You couldn't do it because you didn't know when it was coming. It's exactly what happened to Noah. You see, while Noah was building the ark, he had 70 years. And keep in mind, it had not rained upon the earth by this time. People had never seen rain. So when he was building a boat, people would always be, why are you building a boat? Why do you, why do you need a boat on the land? It's never rained. It's never going to rain. This is something completely new. And in the eyes of the, pe of the wicked people of the world, Noah was a fool. There was no way Noah would need a boat in them. You see, Noah's endurance of these comments from his peers are a prime example of his faithfulness during the flood. Now I'd like to read Genesis chapter 7, verses 11 through 19. And this is just kind of to... Uh, bring, bring everything together at the close of, of chapter 7. So Genesis 7, verses 11 through 19. In the 600 year, 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them, entered into the ark. They and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah. Two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as gods and commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. 
The flood continued forty days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. This is really just wrapping up where things are as the flood begins. And the flood, gone, whatever you put it against, we can see in the scripture it says that it prevails. Everything is covered and nothing stands a chance against the flood. The story of Noah is a story of endings and new beginnings. It's a story that commands of commands and obedience, of judgment and deliverance. We, look at, look, we can look around us today, look at the world, look at the media, look at the things that we see going on, and we can see growing similarities between the old world and the new world. We see the acceptance of sinful ideas such as, as commonplace. We see wars. We see changed ideology. We see the prioritizing of oneself over all else and the growing culture of wickedness. The Bible warns us of a coming judgment when we will look back, when we can look back in Noah's account and understand the things that are coming towards us in the future. As we're beginning to wrap this to a close, I want to take a chance and look at the art door. This may seem like a very odd place, and you may not understand where I'm going with this yet, but just bear with me for a second. The ark's door was Noah's way to deliverance. Noah was saved through his obedience, and when God shut the ark door on him, it kept him safe from the pursuing waters outside of the ark. Our way to deliverance is through Jesus Christ. Everyone's always heard the old adage that the flood is the uh, reverse concept of baptism. Everyone's heard that. But you have, to, you have to understand that Jesus is our salvation. Jesus is our art door. Without Him, there is no way to salvation. There is no way to redemption. And there is no way to God's saving grace. You see, no one was redeemed by his obedience unless it was by God's command. And God's command to us is to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Do we have deliverance on our own? No. Can we ever hope to find deliverance within ourselves? No. Therefore, we have to do what is commanded of us. It's only right. Noah lived a faithful life of obedience to God and was prepared for the judgment that came to his generation. Are you able to fully examine your life and honestly say that you are fully prepared for the coming judgment of your generation? I hope that we can look back at this Genesis chapter 7, the story of Noah and the flood, and be encouraged for the rest of our lives and the hope of saving grace through God's commandments and our obedience to them. Thank you.